edited version of last year's successful book launch and cooking demonstration of Don't Count the Tortillas with chef, writer, and filmmaker Adam Medrano. Uh, this very important work explores the culinary heritage and traditions of South Texas, native food. And we have Adan here this evening with us. Welcome, Adan. Um, and before we get started, I just wanted to say thank you for supporting the important work of Esperanza by turning, tuning in this evening. If you would like to become a monthly donor to support Esperanza's cultural programming and advocacy work, visit esperanzacenter.org slash donate. Uh, you can also donate through Venmo. You just search Esperanza Center or mail in your donations to our office at 922 San Pedro Avenue. If you have any questions, please email the Esperanza at esperanza at esperanzacenter.org or call us at 210-228-0201 or mail in your donations to our... Um, thank you again for your support and uh, take care and stay safe and healthy. So thank you, Adan. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Hudit. Uh, yes, that's important. Stay, stay healthy and wear a mask. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, everyone for, for coming. I'm very happy that Esperanza Peace and Justice Center invited me to um, make a little reflection introduction to um, to these two recorded segments that we did uh, when I launched the uh, the new book, uh, Don't Count the Tortillas. Uh, it's about, it's the art of, of Texas Mexican cooking. And uh, there are two things that, that we'll do. And uh, after I finish uh, this introduction, there are two segments. The first one is when I actually was on stage doing a reading, uh, which I guess can be awfully boring if you s sit there. But this this isn't. It's in my opinion. You'll see what you think, because it explains what what is art, and how comida casera, which is uh, which is la comida de los pobres, de los pobres de, de sur de Texas y de northeastern Mexico, South Texas. It's Poor people's cuisine. So it talks about the creativity and the power that that food has and as an art form. So you'll see a little bit. It's it's a reading. It's in uh, because my book is more than just recipes. It's the history behind the recipes and the meaning of why this food has a central place in our lives. That's the first part, and I think it lasts about 15 minutes. Then uh, the second part is a cooking demonstration. So I think it'll be the first time you see me cook the recipes that I talk a lot about and write about. And um, the that's the second part. And it lasts about 20 minutes, I think 23 minutes. And I cook, um, I cook comida casera. And the people who were there at the event were experts. I mean, this is uh, food that we cook in our homes. And so uh, we did very basic things to show how simplicity really is very beautiful and very complex, even though it's straightforward. And we did, uh, we're gonna cook uh, gorditas, uh, I did. I cooked nopalitos, cleaned the nopalitos. Uh, we did frijoles guisados, which are not your uh, frying pan, uh, high fat frijoles, all healthy food. And we finished with chacales, which uh, very few people know about, but it's a tradition in our region. So that's what this is about. I hope you enjoy it. And um, it's uh, like my mother used to say, uh, don't count the tortillas. Las tortillas no se cuentan. Food is about beauty. It's about hospitality. It's about feeling good and feeling healthy. So let's roll the, the tape and see how it was. Thank you. Esperanza is an incredibly special place for me for many reasons. One, it's a space that affirms identidad and stirs conciencia. It's a space that nurtures the voices of those who are uh, marginalized in society, uh, the voices of queer activists and artists, the voices of women of color, and the voices of those who fight for and struggle for a more just and dignified world. For me, it's a space where we can learn, listen, and be inspired to take action uh, by those who are directly involved in civil and human rights struggles, uh, but struggle to protect uh, public spaces. A big shout out to those who were involved in the Hay Street Bridge Coalition. Thank you for protecting these spaces. 
It's through the Esperanza that I learned about the importance of protecting our sacred waters years ago. Um, and it's uh, a space where I continue to learn about the importance of uh, protecting and reclaiming our right to free speech. It's a space where we can learn about our beautiful cultura through um, musicians, creative visionaries, artists, writers, cultural workers, and chefs. Yes. It's a space where I know my students will be welcome and where they will learn and experience the transformative power of artistic expression in this space. So if you're here for any of these reasons, I encourage you to be a monthly donor. De Esperanza relies on the generous support of Buena Gente Like You so that we can continue doing this important work, um, all of the arts programming, the cultural organizing, and community activism. We want to make sure that these events are accessible to our communities where they can learn and be inspired and to be a part of social change. And any gift helps, big or small. Of course, we encourage you to be a monthly donor. If you have any questions about being a monthly donor, Graciela here has some envelopes that she will have available. And you can uh, contact me or you can contact Natalie Rodriguez, who's somewhere here. She is our fundraising coordinator. She and I would be very happy to answer any questions. So um, I'd like to introduce now our very esteemed guest. Adam Medrano is a chef and food writer, author of Truly Texas Mexican, a native culinary heritage and recipes, and Don't Count the Tortillas, the art of Texas Mexican cooking. He now lives in Houston, but grew up in San Antonio and Northern Mexico, where he developed his expertise in the flavor profiles of indigenous Texas Mexican food. Adan spent 23 years traveling and working throughout Latin America, Europe, and Asia, where he came to recognize the importance of food and culinary traditions in society. He returned to the US in 2010 to focus on the culinary traditions of the Mexican American community of Texas. He is a graduate of the Culinary Institute of America and has a Master of Arts degree in radio, television, and film from the University of Texas at Austin. So please help me welcome our very esteemed guest, Chef Adan Medrano. I want to thank uh, uh, Graciela for, and her team for inviting me. Uh, this is a book more than just cooking uh, because it opens up what cooking is for us. So because of that, I, we're doing three things today. I'd like to read from the book a little bit so you get a sense for it. Then I'm going to go and demonstrate some of the cooking techniques that really belong to the community of uh, Mexican-Americans of Texas. And then we're going to eat and drink, and that will be very special. I was about six years old, crouched at the table, watching a mom make tortillas by hand enjoying the aroma and rhythm of it all. She was fast. As the pile grew taller, I wondered how many she'd made so fast. I reached over and, practicing the arithmetic I was learning at school, began adding them up. She stopped me. Don't count the tortillas. Over the years, I've remembered her voice, her inflection, that stack of corn tortillas, and I've learned the many meanings of that dicho. Don't count the tortillas. It's one of many I grew up hearing and repeating. The words have guided me toward an understanding that cooking is more than mere mechanics and feeding. Cooking is about elemental connectedness and generosity. It is technical, creative, with the power to captivate. It is art. The art of cooking is the theme throughout this book, about Texas Mexican food, a cuisine with a history that archaeologists trace back 10,000 years to the culinary traditions of the first Native Americans of Texas and Northeastern Mexico, Carancawa, Toncawa, Coahuilteca, Chichimeca, Cado, and hundreds of other culturally rich communities. It isn't south of the border cuisine because its historical roots are to be found north and south of the Rio Grande, both. 
in places like Corpus Christi, San Antonio, McAllen, as well as in Piedras Negras, Matamoros, and Monterrey. The Texas-Mexican culinary region extends as far north as Houston and as far south as Monterrey. Within this region, families like mine cook the same dishes, using the same techniques and ingredients, celebrating a cuisine that developed and flourished centuries before the river became the U.S.-Mexico border. The comida casera, home cooking, that I grew up eating was created and enjoyed by Mexican-American families of Texas. It is Texas Mexican food. Just as Oaxaca Mexican food represents an identifiable indigenous region of Mexico cuisine, as do also Jalisco Mexican food, Puebla Mexican food and others, Texas Mexican food is distinctively regional. The power of culinary art. Over my many years of cooking at home and at restaurants, I've come to appreciate the cook as a culinary artist whose food has no lesser power to captivate or become a memorable personal experience imbued with social meaning than any art, other art that speaks to us compellingly. I think we all have important food memories. Perhaps it's the exquisitely balanced chicken mole served at a wedding or the aromatic arroz con pollo enjoyed at a birthday celebration. Food fosters human interaction and creates memories and connections that can endure a lifetime. All art has a past, and particular works of art either reference or are based on the work of previous artists. Texan Mex Texas Mexican cooking is no exception. All cooking has lineage that's why every dish within a certain cuisine is similar to the, all the other dishes in that family. Korean, Thai, French, Italian, whatever your heritage or preference, every cuisine is a family of dishes that resemble each other in flavor, appearance, and cooking technique. If you're like me, whenever you are drawn to a cuisine, you are drawn to its history which can only enrich your enjoyment. I chose the title of this book as Don't Count the Tortillas because it is an example of how evocative a phrase can be, not unlike a particular food itself. The cookie recipes for marranitos on page 194 of your book took, took me more than a dozen times to get right, to tweak the recipe until the cookie tasted just the way I remember it from my childhood from the corner bakery. It does. The art of Texas Mexican cooking, just like other Mexican American arts, comes from having the confidence to quote, claim knowledge based on your experience and that of your community, end of quote from Antonia Castaneda. I know about cooking because I learned from my ama, as did many cooks who specialize in Mexican cooking. Gender is key in understanding our community and how our cooking has developed. This book, and especially the recipes herein, honor the central role that women have played in creating comida casera, Texas Mexican cooking. Understood as art, food links our many social relationships and also the many contexts of those relationships. Just as each dish functions as part of a collection of a larger cohesive cuisine, each encounter with food artistry functions as part of a larger tableau in our lives. Each and every dish on the menus of family restaurants like Doña Maria in Houston, Maria's restaurant in McAllen, El Puesto Number no. 2 in San Antonio and West Side, each dish shares the Texas Mexican flavor profile and style of cooking. The power to tantalize is strong because every dish is really related to a whole, to a culinary family. The cook will inject a little twist here or there using her polished technique, but the main artistic intent is to introduce flavor subtleties, contrasted textures, and visual cues that make guests say, wow, these pinto beans take me to my mom's kitchen. 
or that chicken mole is just what we had at my cousin's beautiful wedding. With each meal, La Buena Cocinera, the good cook, narrates to, to us who we are as a community, and with enchanting food, conjures up togetherness. It's through the pleasure of eating that a cook's artistry enmeshes diners in a world of what holds us together. For me, the roots of those connections stretch back to past generations of my family and community. Food memories. <clears throat> when we picked the cotton, we wore cotton gloves to protect our hands that nonetheless were scarred and bloody from the picks of the cotton ball. La pisca was brutally difficult, dirty, and oppressive. I did not like it, but I endured it, and sometimes my younger sister Fina and I even sang as we were picking, and the singing helped. Lunch brought a respite from the hard work. We'd enjoy tacos, handmade, wonderfully soft flour tortillas with flavorful pinto beans, chili on the side. Sometimes we'd have Mexican rice also on the side and hard-boiled eggs. My mouth actually waters as I recall the taste of my mother's flour. Recently at Houston's family-owned Alamo Tamales, I was polishing off my lunch of pork with nopalitos, carefully folding pieces of flour tortillas into little scoops, using them to spoon up all the delicious sauce. I ran out of tortillas. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> so getting up quickly, I scurried to the cash register to ask for more tortillas. Got two and asked how much. The menu says three seventy-five per dozen. The server said, nada, está bien. Nothing, it's okay. She'd seen my need. From the conclusion. When food is delicious, it helps us connect us to each other and to the planet we share as our home. Taken together, each and every dish that we've shared has in some way shaped who we are. It's the culture of hospitality that heightens the enjoyment of good food and reinforces the work of a creative cook. Delicious. It helps us connect us to each other and to the planet we share as our home. Taken together, each and every dish that we've shared has in some way shaped who we are. It's the culture of hospitality that heightens the enjoyment of good food and reinforces the work of a creative cook. I experience hospitality as an atmosphere of generosity, of openness to others and also to change. A good meal invites us to soften our boundaries and rigidity towards the other. The art of cooking necessitates the cultivation of a generosity that instinctively offers our guests more tortillas to finish up scooping his nopalitos and pork. As Ama would have advised, don't count the tortillas. Thank you. American community of Texas, the descendants of the first people to step foot on the state of Texas. So there are many people here who have cooked this hundreds of times. So correct me as I go along, but do it nicely. Please. <laughs> yes. Tell me, what's the trick to making recipes look like the picture? Ah. <laughs> well, the, yes, I will repeat the questions. What is the trick? To making your recipe at home look like the pictures in the book. <laughs> try and try and try again. That's what I can say. What I'm going to do right away is I'm going to take the nopales because they have to cook and they'll just cook a little bit. We're going to make we're going to make uh, ensalada de nopalitos. 
We're going to make chacales. Who knows what chacales are? Okay, chacales. Okay, very good. I will tell you the story of chacales. We had a tough time finding them. And then we're going to cook uh, frijoles guisados. Frijoles guisados with no oil. And then some gorditas. And I'm, I'm doing the frijoles and the gorditas and the others because I want to... Uh, I want to highlight that our food has been nourishing us for millennia. This is this is going to because it is not only delicious but it's also nutritious and it's simple. By simple, I don't mean uninteresting. By simple, I mean elegant and powerful. So each of these dishes. Is, uh, has complex flavors that come together. But if you don't know about it, if you come from on the outside of the culture, you think it's very simple and very and not complex. So you know that the, the nopales can be, can be gotten at these stores now, and they're very expensive. They used to be very inexpensive, remember? You can grow them in your backyard. I suggest that everyone here plant a, a, a nopalito because just go back there and cut them, and you don't have to go and pay so much for them. You know how you, you know how to do that? Yeah. Not a, okay. When you when you buy them, they're going to have all the spines. The first thing you do is you take all around, you go all around like that, all around with a sharp knife. Then with tongs, because uh, this one has already some of them removed. Then you they pop up, they pop up. So you you're just flick, flicking them off, see like that, like that. So that you, you get rid of all of them. Usually you're doing it on a on a board, so it's a lot easier because it's flat and all the bumps you just go like this and they and they come out. And it ends up and they come out of the uh, of their little pod. So it ends up you know looking like this. What I'm going to do now is uh, start the nopalitos. You simply cut them into little cubes and uh, and you cook them and you boil them. I sometimes saute them for the uh, for the ensalada, but this time I'm just going to boil them. And when you get the ensalada today, and uh, you get to taste it, you will know that it's not just the green of the nopales that you're tasting, but you're tasting the, the elements that are with it. The secret to the Mexican-American, Texas Mexican cooking is, we develop flavor not just through ingredients, but through technique. So as soon as I, this was, uh, going to be already done, but uh, I uh, got to talking. You know how that goes. I mean, if you, if you, you don't actually do it. Esta cosa está caliente. Bueno. So how many of you have cooked cactus? Todos. Todos. Okay. Good. So correct me. Whether, did you boil it? You boil it. No. Okay. Esta cosa está así. The thing about the cactus is it's going to become a trendy food in fine dining restaurants because our scientists have discovered that of all the plants in the planet, this, for the amount of calories you get, you get maximum nutrition. And it lowers blood pressure. It's a very uh, super food on our planet. So you put it on, and I'm just going to let it boil. While it boils, I'm going to start with the chacales. Now, chacales are interesting. You know, but I'll start with the gorditas because that's easy and I can tell you about, about mis tamal. You know, I get this from Maseca. Uh, do you remember when we used to have molinos and, and then you could go and get the masa directly? We need more of those. Uh, we're going to go come back to the. Okay, very good question. Why did I leave the cactus? Okay, and uh, so the first step in the nopalito salad is to cook the cactus. So you, you boil it. I hadn't boiled it before, so I'm going to do other stuff while it boils. And then afterwards, I will assemble it. Good question. How do you get rid of the slime? Then when you, when you boil it, it gets slimy. Uh, I uh, will boil it for about 20 minutes until it gets soft. And then uh, when you rinse it, then it will not be slimy. When you, when you saute it, if you saute it for 17 minutes in oil, it also reduces the, the, the mucus. And then when it folds into the other ingredients, you, uh, you get a, a nice mouthfeel. Some people drink the water. 
they have it in the water and they drink it because that's very salutary. This is nixtamalized corn. I'm not going to wash my hands because I did so earlier. Uh, this is something all of you have done, or most of you have done. I just chose this because it's simple, las bonitas. It's simple in its appearance. This nixtamalized corn was invented by women. Corn was engineered by women about 9,000 years ago. Corn does not exist in the wild. Corn is a woman-made invention. And I say women because we know that that long ago, even to 5,000 and 4,000, in those cultures, women were in charge of food, both gathering, and they had all the knowledge about how to prepare it. And so we know that corn did not exist. It suddenly appeared. A woman made it by mixing a seed with something else. So, and then 2,000 years later, they realized in Mexico that uh, it didn't have a lot of nutrition. If you eat corn, if you eat a, eat a, a, a cup of corn, it doesn't have a high level of protein, and you don't get niacin. So you will, you will become sick because it doesn't give you the niacin that your body needs. And so about 2,000, 3,000 years ago, another woman invented nixtamalized corn, which is what you have here. And the tortillas are nixtamalized corn. Uh, you know nixtamalized corn? Tiene cal. Tiene cal. Tiene cal. They took potassium hydroxide. So you burn wood, and that's the potassium, the wood, la, 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 the white stuff. You boil the dried corn with it, and it becomes hominy. And that is molecularly different from corn. The protein has been improved, so it's digestible. You will survive on it. And it, it develops niacin, so that your body will be able to sustain itself. And that was a huge invention because it kept it kept all of the uh, uh, cultures alive with this type of high nutrition. The problem that the Europeans had when they came and they took the corn back, they saw that it was very nutritious because we survived on it, but they didn't bother to ask anybody how to do it. So there was widespread malnutrition in Italy, uh, parts of uh, England, that's because they were eating the corn. They didn't know about nixtamalization. And so I always say, and the reason my book, I'm so glad that, that I'm launching my book here because it's cultura. Cuisine, divorced from its culture, has no legs. And cuisine, divorced from its story, has no legs. Mira, this is more uh, squishy. I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see it. So, uh, the reason that I wanted to do this is not because you don't know how to do it. I think most of you do. But it's just that I wanted to tell you how important and central it is to our lives. And when people from the outside see it, that's what I, why I wrote the book. If, you, if you're looking at it just as a product, as a commodity, as a thing, and you don't see the relationship that it has had to our history, you know, to, to women and to the ideas that we have developed, it's not going to be good for you. It's not going to be as beneficial as it would otherwise. So I'm doing this for the benefit of, uh, of emphasizing the importance of culture. I'm going to let this sit. You, know, you have to let it sit for about 20 minutes, and then it will, it, will, uh, it will rehydrate. And then, of course, you wash your hands. Este, are there any questions at this time? Before I... Before I <laughs> bueno, the next thing we're going to do is the chacales. Chacales are the same thing. Chacales are hominy, which is nixtamalized corn. Dried, they crack it, and then you boil it. And then what we're going to do is, is do a very nice combination of cilantro, tomate, garlic, and uh, onion. That's a recognizable uh, little combination. I chose chacales. You will be able to taste them tonight because when we asked around, nobody in, in, in at HEB or the other stores stores had any had had them. Uh, thank you. And they found it this morning at, at uh, us. Where did you? No, La Michoacana did not have it. 
Las Americas. None of the stores had it. This is what the, the, the Goya sells it. You take the hominy, and, and, and my, my spouse will literally crack it. And it gives you a very creamy, this is where, where the Italians got their polenta. It gives you a very creamy, creamy substance, and then you add uh, the seasonings. But it's interesting that this is a classic traditional dish of Coahuila and Chihuahua in this area. And over time, we've lost the memory of it such that we can't get it. And that is a huge surprise for me. We're losing our traditions, and we are because we're losing the traditions, losing our nutrition. That's important. So what you do with the, with the chacales is you, you make the, something that all of you are going to know. And this is uh, es un guisado. You take something all of you are familiar with, onion. This is how you would do most of them. This is a classic combination. Onion, put a little bit of oil. The thing about the onion, tomato, and uh, chile, or cilantro, they call it mexicana because it resembles the Mexican flag. A salsa mexicana, remember? So you are going to cook it until you find that uh, all of it has become very, very soft. Mira, ya está viendo el nopalicos. The thing about the chacales is, uh, again, I predict that the nopal and the chacal, as more of us write about it and share the food outside of our families, I think it's going to become very important in restaurants. And can you imagine it used to be part of our community's heritage and then we're no longer able to get it? That's interesting to me. And I am very surprising. So these is one, two, three. Now I'm going to make some gorditas. When you make gorditas, do you put oil in them? Yes, some put oil. Who puts salt in them? Some. Okay, not, not too many. Okay. I, I didn't put salt in these. I didn't put salt in these. So what I'm going to do is make them very, very small, and then I'm going to mix them with, with the beans. It's still very wet. I think it'll dry. I'm going to uh, recommend to you that you look at the recipe I have in my book for the. That's the way I make it. I welcome your comments because there's more. Tiene más que un toque una ensalada. Le puedes dar, you know, different, different, uh, riching touches. That's that's what I talk about in my book. In my book, in this La Cocinera, tiene el toque. You give it that little touch that is yours. And most of those cocineras have been women. So it's interesting that most of the people who have the voice and who are on television are men. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> I'm going to put salt on the guisado. That's ready. I just threw some garlic in there. Any more questions? Or Yes, ma'am. My grandmother's kitchen, just the smell of the smell. Oh, the smell brings you. It's the smell, isn't it? The smell brings you into a, a new world. It's, I, I, I love it. Now, what I did is I threw some cilantro in here, and then I'm going to uh, put it in a. I need to turn my back on you, sorry. You know, I see many of you here whose recipes are in my book, so. Once el guisado está, se lo pones acá, and then you throw in the cooked, the cooked the chacales. The cooked no. chacales. Para, uh, sí. Estaba yo no. buscando los cuadrinos en esta temporada, y un señor, un anciano mexicano, me dijo, no los uh, coseches en la mañana, los cuadrinos se cosechan. Oh. En la tarde tienen mejor sabor. Muy interesante. Mira, this is the chacales. You soak them overnight, like light beans, and then you cook them. Uh, and these, we weren't able to soak them because we didn't find them until this morning. So I think they cook what, for four hours or something. And they get soft, like light beans. And so you put them in with a guisado. This is what you're going to taste tonight. And uh, normally they would be cooking in water, so I'm just going to add water. 
and then you let the flavors come together for about 15 minutes, 10 minutes, and you put it up. And then at the end, when it's finished, then you throw the extra cilantro. Because cilantro, the, the oil of cilantro, uh, goes up and is combustible very, very fast. So it's something that you put in at the, put in at the last minute because the oils of cilantro broke in the air and they dissolve, they evaporate very quickly. The oil of the oregano takes more time. So you put in the oregano early when you're boiling so that the oregano, it takes a long time for the oils to come out. It needs a, a longer time oil. So just remember that. Okay, we've we got our chacales going, our nopales are going, let me show you. Ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> No se quemaron, no se quemaron. No. I'm just going to, uh, cuando se pone la plática, si se queman los frijoles. <laughs> okay, this is ready. I'm going, to have to, uh, I'm going to have to ask someone to put it through a sieve and drain them because since they can cook, some in the kitchen. Mira. Okay, I'm going to go to the beans. Esta cosa, you all know these, my mom had. I'm going to show you well fried beans, frijoles guisados. Frijoles guisados is the way my mom did it, many of us do it that way, no oil. You develop the flavor from the beans because you roast them, you pan roast them. And when they reach, let me put this away, when they reach a temperature of 300, my mom says, está bien cocido. But the Swiss people got a hold of that. Do you want to take that and just drain it? Siempre es bueno tener un asistente. Remember that. So if you have a big family, uh, see, you were the asistente. Yes. Okay. How many were by your mother's side? Do this. Compra esto. Okay. We're there. Which is a good thing. Which is a good thing because then you have all those wonderful memories. So this, I'm gonna let this cool a little bit, and then we're just gonna arrange it in a plate for the nopalitos, which you, who you have later. The reason I want to do these beans is, nos dicen que la comida nuestra, about which I write in this book, no tiene nada. Es que no entienden que tiene mucho. The Swiss got a hold of this technique, and they called it. It's the Maillard reaction. That's the name of the scientist, the Maillard reaction, M-A-I-L-L-A-R-D. The Maillard reaction was uh, discovered and named by the Europeans in the 1920s. And what that is, is when protein in a chemical like meat or beans reaches around 300, 380 degrees, the protein molecule changes and it becomes very complex with much more flavor. And it also uh, is the reason that the color changes. It's different from caramelization because caramelization certainly is the starches. But los frijoles, los mueles así y luego los jueces. It reaches, it reaches that temperature. You never, you scrape it from the bottom. Y luego, you remember your mother doing this and you leave it for a long time. You leave it there. Y se está cociendo, se está cociendo. When it's doing that, it reaches that temperature and you have this beautifully tasting beans. The restaurants, the Tex-Mex restaurants, want to achieve great taste in beans, but they don't understand the structure of the beans that this protein can be very delicious. And depending on how you store the beans and how you treat them, they will be better. You know, we all remember really good beans. When you go to a restaurant, can you tell when they have bad beans? Verdad. I mean, you can tell. It's, and and I, this, this is why. They cannot get this flavor because they don't know their technique. And that's why I'm saying, in our comida casera, es comida de los pobres, and, and, and many times no tenemos todo lo que, lo que quisiéramos tener. And so with what is there, we understand it and we develop flavor through technique. Es la cocina de los pobres que viene siendo una cosa maravillosa. It's, and when you have it in, in Italy, they call it cucina povera, and it's served in fine dining restaurants. The French call it uh, country cooking. But it's the same principle. It's, 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 it's la comida de los pobres y que encontramos la manera to cook a really beautiful meal for our, for our family. When we know they're coming home, we want to see that look on their faces. 
and we cook them with uh, frijoles guisados like this one. I'm going to I'm going to actually make them here, but this is something that you've seen your father do, your mother do, right? And you do yourself. No le pongas aceite, no oil. The restaurants develop the it will it will have a flavor of casi casi carne, casi umami. Well, you've tasted really good beans. So the restaurants they add bacon or they add other things because they cannot develop this flavor. And the reason I'm doing this is to reinforce the fact that our food may look simple, but it's nutritious and delicious without adding all the fat. Keep in mind that, in my book, I say this with chorizo. Keep in mind that the pigs are new to us. It's a new tradition, lard. Pigs arrived in the 1600s. Before that, we did not have frying. We did not have heavy use of oil. That is a new tradition. If you want, if you want to go back to the way we, we, you want to remember and renew by remembering what was healthy, and this is what was healthy. In my book, I, I, I talk about the first time that uh, this king in Michoacan was receiving the Spaniards, and, 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 and they brought him as a gift uh, some pigs. This was unknown to us. We didn't know what pigs were. We got we, we got oil. We got from ducks. From other animals, from uh, from nuts, from fish, and so they bring in the the pigs. He said, "El rey dice, ¿Qué nos traen estos señores ratas?" <laughs> and he immediately had them killed because he thought they were rats and they were bad luck. Of course, he was right about the second one being yeah. bad luck. And the Spaniards were not killed, but they had made a terrible mistake. The point is that uh, some traditions came through colonization. They're new to us. We should re-examine them and see if maybe we do want to keep them. Some of them are good, but some of them are not. And I think high fat, high lard is not good. It's not part of our traditional indigenous culture. And when you make these beans, don't add. If you want to add a, 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 you know, a teaspoon, a tablespoon, fine. But we cook them like this. You will, they're, they're going to be wonderful. How many have cooked like this? Open your hand. Yeah, yes. So you know, verdad, no más guisados. Y luego at the, at the top, it's going to be una capita, right? Una capita de. This technique, I write about in the book, this is a technique that people don't understand. That's why they give beans a bad name. They don't understand how, how exquisite that is. Mira, se nos está yendo el tiempo. I'm just going to arrange the stuff. That dicho has many meanings. And, uh, the first two that I write about that I understood is, yeah, you're playing with the food. It's like, don't play with the food. These tortillas are not commodities. They're not things for you to be, to be counting. They're bigger than you are. Food is sacred. It's going to lead to hospitality and relationships. Don't count them as they were just objects out there. Have no respect for them. Secondly, no las cuentes eh, sabiendo que va a llegar una visita. Offer them gen with generosity. Don't count them. You know, just offer them. Uh, there are other meanings that I, that I started thinking about, but those were the two. It's a wonderful thing. Las tortillas no se cuentan. They're too sacred. I need for you to explain the difference between pinto beans and black beans. Do you like in which one tastes better, the black beans or the pinto beans? Great. Thank you. Thank you. I have a uh, I have a little essay in my blog where I say, if you're from Texas in this region, pinto beans are philosophically correct. Yeah. The first time I was in Tehuantepec, I was in high school, and they served me black beans. This is down in Central and South South of Mexico. They have black beans because it goes with that type of food. So it's a regional thing. The eastern part, they prefer black black beans. Before the Europeans came. All of the Texas area, northeastern Mexico, was in communication with Mesoamerica, with Mexico, with the Yucatan. Archaeologists archeolog have, have discovered that. And second, so, so that's why we have a lot of similarities, because all through uh, before uh, 1528, we were communicating. The indigenous peoples from here were communicating with the indigenous peoples from down south. and. Uh, that's why we're all having some similarities, but ours is our regional cuisine, just like Puebla has their has their cuisine. So.
The bottom is roasted. You scrape the bottom, and they will be dry and roasted. There's a layer. You flip them over. Get all that roasted. It's good flavor up, up like that. Then that layer will begin to get roasted. Then you do it again. Okay. I noticed your beans that you poured in the pot were already a rounded. They had a roundness to a plumpness about them that looked like they were already soft. That's what I'm missing. Before they even go to the pan. Oh yeah, they're boiled soft. And was that your question? I don't know how to get them there. Oh, they stay hard. Yeah. Keep boiling them. <laughs> Keep boiling them. I'll tell you what we're going to eat. Um, this is how you, you saw me. That's how you clean on the pot. I mean, a uh, I'll cut it right. You take it out and then you. you this is how you do it, right? Yeah. Bueno, I'm going to plate this later because uh, we, we're running out of time. I would rather listen to your conversations than go with this because much of this you know. I'm, I'm not going to finish, but I just want to say why I pick this. Because it, people will think they're simple and therefore not delicious. And I say they're complex and very delicious. You simply haven't been with a culture to understand how important it is to know how to develop flavor when you are in a situation of poverty and need and you come out in a very delicious way. That's why I chose these things. I um, we're going to eat we're going to eat chacales and they're going to serve them over here. Chacales, we're going to have sopa de chayote. Uh, that's a new recipe that I developed with my uh, in my kitchen. You're going to taste tostadas de guagua, de, de tinga de guajolote. You're going to taste uh, quesadillas de chile poblano con pico de, de, de cebolla. And then for dessert, you're going to have galletitas de mezquita, mezquite cookies. And then almohadas. The, the almohadas is a new recipe I developed. It's strawberries, fresas con jicama. And my mother and I mean my sister said, what? Jicama. I said, it, it's an interesting, it's an interesting texture with the soft and, 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 the, and the crunch. And then for the uh, drink, you, well, they have agua fresca, but we have a cocktail. It's called Chicano 40. And Chicano 40 was developed by Jared Peña, who's, who's uh, the bar person here in San Antonio, very famous. Uh, it's called Chicano 40 because he made it for the 40th anniversary year of the Chicano Film Festival. And the reason I wanted to, for you to taste it is because it has it has two important ingredients. Well, it has tequila and mezcal. Okay. Fuck. But in addition to that, we from this land, it has it has watermelon and campari. You know what campari is? That liquor. Campari is a liquor. You know, very. Well, la sandia. Uh, it has sandia with vinegar. But the campari has a bright, bright red color, which is which comes from the beetle. That is in the nopal. You know, nopal sometimes that has white little beetles. The allí, our ancestors would squeeze them, squeeze them. That's red paint. That's how they they got the walls. So Campari from Italy used our nopal beetles to color their drink. So because of this history, I wanted you to taste the the uh, that Chicano Forty. Pero ya les dije, cuidado a los que ya nos les deben de servir otra. So uh, I want to introduce the ladies who cooked it for you. They followed my recipes. Uh, Rosalia Vargas. Uh, Yolanda Salazar. Las otras cocineras cocinó, pero no están. Está Angie Merla. Blanca, Blanca Rivera. Y Imelda de León. And from the, and from the uh, Esperanza Center, the two staff people, Judit Vega, Judit, you, you talk to and uh, Elisa, and Elisa Harris. But I was telling you to go up and start. ¿Qué te... ¿Qué pensaste de los chacales? Oh, bueno, primero, buenas tardes a todos. Pues en la, he venido a mal, los chacales son unos camarones. 
doctora, que cuando decía que con maíz tamalizado, yo pensaba que se iban a cubrir con los chacales, con este maíz, y se iban a servir. Pero ahí lo decía Frito, eh, en esa confusión de que el, el chacal en la, en la izquierda de mi mamá, mi mamá es ismeña, de Tehuantepec, Oaxaca, hay algún chacal de estos camarones rojos que también aquí hay, pero no, <risa> y está delicioso el platillo, no lo conocía. ¿Cuál de los platos usted de trabajo? ¿Todos o? Pues yo trabajé en todo, les ayudaba en todo lo que me dijera ella, yo lo, yo lo hacía. Y lo hice con mucho cariño para todos ustedes y con mucho amor. ¿Alguno de los platos te recordó de algo, de tu familia? Sí, los, oh, los nopalitos. No, no, palito, porque decía, hoy no hay carne, este, pues está muy difícil la situación. Eh, vamos a hacer, un, en vez de carne, unos bisteces asados. Mamá, pues dices que no hay carne. No, los no palitos asados es una cosa maravillosa y un molcajete con salsa mexicana. Esos eran nuestros bisteces para nosotros. Y Judith, ¿qué cocinaste tú? Todo. Ah, todo, pero más que, más que me fascinó fue las uh, galletas de, de mezquite. ¿Por qué? No sé, porque siempre crecí como colectando las, las semillas y como comiéndolas como dulce, pero nunca, nunca había probado la harina. Qué bien. ¿Qué te impresionó de lo que cocinaste? Ah, pues yo cociné más la, la sopa de chayote y nunca había comido chayote o tomatillos juntos y nada de eso, pero me gustó mucho y era como un lot of fun, so like, you know, the recipes, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, let's give them a round of applause. The other has been mine.